Uh, thanks for joining us today uh, for our lightning talks for Open Aperio 2022. Uh, my name is Sean Foster and I'm going to be the host for today's presentations. Uh, lightning talks are a collection of short five minute uh, presentations uh, from a, very, a variety of topics uh, from different speakers in our community. So um, in the past, I've had the pleasure of attending a number of lightning talks at uh, past Open Aperio events, and, and I love the diversity and, and the of the various projects and themes um, that we get to learn about in this hour. So I hope it's a great way to um, for everyone to enjoy the other work that's happening in our community uh, that might be outside of your normal projects and streams. Um, as I mentioned, each presenter will have five minutes. Uh, presenters, I'll ask that you be ready when uh, the uh, speaker before you is wrapping up so that we can jump right into your topic and make sure everyone has time to tell their story today. Um, I'll introduce each topic and speaker briefly and then we'll turn it over to the presenter and I'll start the clock. I'll uh, give you a one minute warning and uh, let you know when your time is almost up. And um, if, you, if anyone in the audience today would like to know more about the presenters or about the, um, the, their sessions, uh, please visit the conference website for a list of their bios and their presentation descriptions. If, uh, if you have any questions as the presenters are going on, just put them in the chat and the presenters will be able to re reply to them after their presentation uh, because the five minutes goes by really quickly. And with all that said, we'll, we'll dive into these uh, presentations. Uh, the first one up will be Inga. And uh, Andy will be on deck after that. Uh, yes, today we're going to talk about shop till you drop. And I hope I can talk as quick as you can. Um, so uh, I can put a lot in five minutes. My name is Inge Donkervoort and I'm from Zurti. Um, and today I'm going to show you a project that's uh, at the moment in the Netherlands um, uh, going on. Um, let's start with the, the goals. Uh, it's, uh, all the vocation, vocational schools in the Netherlands are uh, working together to share open content with each other. So one school creates a module about uh, cutting hair and the other cre creates a module about communication and they uh, share each other's uh, modules and uh, can use it. Um, they all use Xerti. Uh, and in, um, they have their own installation and then they, they create modules uh, for, um, for their own education. But they wanted to share it and they wanted to have a, a good quality. They wanted to be uh, accessible. Um, so I'm sorry, this is in Dutch, uh, this uh, um, drawing. But um, this is the goal of the project is in this, this um, drawing. Then um, when we're talking about those uh, edu uh, vocational education schools, uh, there are a lot of them uh, over the whole of Netherlands. Netherlands is very small, comparing, for example, to the US. So, uh, but for us, this is a lot of schools. And they are all trying to, to share their content with each other. So um, they um, get together and created a project, uh, what's called Share and Reuse. And here you see uh, some of the uh, 30 modules that the schools created. And as you can see, they all look different. So um, if, for example, this learning object, we call it learn learning object, is imported in the uh, 30 installation of this school, this is another school, it would have the pink uh, header and the, the, the look and feel of this school and not of this one. And then they can start um, uh, uh, changing things and use it for themselves. So there are a lot of different um, views that, that you can have at the moment. Uh, why do they use Xerti? They use it because it's an open source authoring tool. Um, they, uh, they can share it and uh, use the same templates, but then it looks like their own schools uh, look and feel. So not from the others. Um, you can reuse it. You can share and reuse it uh, between the schools. And uh, it fits in every learning management system. So it doesn't matter what LMS you have, uh, you can use it. And every uh, school can change it to fit to the needs of their own students. And this is what uh, it will be. Uh, this is a, a concept of the website. and. Each uh, evening, um, the the zerties from the different schools will be harvested, and we use the OIEPMH 
protocol for that and um, the modules will be put on one website and then as a school you can go there and take the modules that you want to use for your education and um, uh, put it in your own Xerti module and a Xerti installation, um, uh, rewrite it a bit, give the credits, of course, to the school that created it, and so you can use it. So how does that look? This is a, um, a website from uh, an organization that uh, is from the uh, government and for example when you go down here you have um, a, a 30 module it's called called burgerschap and loopbaan that's typical dutch um, you can show of a look how the uh, module looks and then when you say okay this is the one i want then you go back and you go you can one minute remaining yes and instead of looking how it looks like, you can download it and put it in your own installation. So that was my um, uh, my lightning talk. And um, as you can imagine, those schools can shop till they drop because there is a lot of content available and um, they can use it for their own uh, education. That was my lightning talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Inga. That was great and perfect timing too. I'm sure lots of institutions will be interested in, in investigating that too. Uh, next up, we have Andy and on deck, we have Stephanie. Okay, so how, uh, okay, I'll start now. Hi everybody, my name is Andy and this is my personal project, Select Your Cause. So let's give you 10 seconds. I'll do a live demo perhaps first. So this is Select Your Cause and I'll here, I'll copy this command here go to here just paste it press enter i'll talk about it more later on right so it's one thing right good so let's move on to the presentation so i love appeal cost so of course this is an enterprise grade um multilingual single sign on solution for a web and it's really powerful supporting various protocol like cars so of sample so on and so forth and also support different type of components as well like jdbc ldap and so on and so forth the community is really, really great, very active, and make sure the project is up to date. And of course, this is open source. So all the great thing about open source. But I think the greatest strength of a project might as well be the greatest weaknesses because of how um, powerful a pro class is, is actually quite complex. So people need to read a lot of documentation, they may get confused, and some might even flat out refuse to use the product because of the complexity. So what Select Your Cars, my project, uh, is trying to do is to provide an alternative way for them to try out to onboard them to the Apple Cars. So uh, uh, Select Your Cars is actually an um, like fully stack customizable example project. So they can just, uh, within a few clicks, they can have an uh, already uh, working example for them to try out Apple Cars instead of just them trying uh, building it from the ground up. So um, yeah. So CL cars, customizable full stack cars example. Uh, of course, this is open source. I haven't mentioned it right here, but and also uh, you just press a few clicks and this uh, whole loop, uh, instant will be speed up. So look at it, this here. This seems like a very complex architectural diagram, but actually the entire thing is already built into set your cars. So if you want any type of component here, you just click, 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 and then speed up the local instant and you can try it out yourself. Right, so let's get back to live demo. I think it's still spinning up, but no worries. I'll talk about the layout. So when you pull it from the GitHub repo, you have this screen right here, and you can uh, uh, select where you want the authentication to happen, like uh, MongoDB, MySQL, like LDAP, for example, very uh, normal. You want some attribute from the REST, you want some different type of client, like Java client, PHP client, so on and so forth, uh, and for some sample, all of a lot of things. So. For example, uh, let's see, let's just log into like a plain old Java uh, class uh, web app. So yes, you can see, as you can see, with just a few minutes, the whole thing is already speed up. And I can just copy this open LDAP user. And this user is pulling directly from the local instance, LDAP instance that you just created. So this user is actually an uh, user from the open LDAP, right? So you can look at the source code and you can see how it is created, how it's integrated with cars. And I'll just press uh, login 
and you can see the user is logged successfully and you can see all the attributes but wait you can see that actually there's a rest in the recipe attribute keys why is that because it is pulling uh, another thing from the rest attribute storage so we can see the rest attribute storage in action from my source code and the actual demonstration right here in your local cluster with just a few clicks right okay i think so sometimes so let's let's try the sample run right so we have cars now just try out the sample php one this another uh, language another framework is simple sample and i just click, click uh, right here and say the link single sign out uh, go very quick and you can see the user is logged in successfully as well so uh, as you can see very very quick very very easy and you can have a things for you to spin up uh, to to play with like okay so this few slide is just in case the live demo didn't work and uh i think we don't have time for q a right uh, but if you have you can uh, I, I think we still have some time right yeah you have one minute left that was great though thank you for oh, that demo I, yeah i don't think i Okay, let, let me just show you another thing as well. So cars sample, of course, there's O of as well. Let's let's just try out the O of as well. So because we have time, so I just press the O of here, go to here, press enter. You see the O of protocol kicking in, the single sign on, and allow. And O of login successful, everything is working, and you can look at the code to see how it works. Right. So thank you very much. This is my presentation. Thank you so much, Andy. Uh, do you want to put, yeah. put that link to your uh, GitHub in the chat and in the notes, and then yeah, if yeah, you're willing yeah. to share it with others, and they might yeah, be interested in checking it out afterwards. So great. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Our next presenter up is Stephanie Schlafhofer. Oh, I didn't do that right. Sorry, from Purdue University. Uh, and she's going to be telling us about streamlining student advising. So Stephanie, I will turn it over to you. All right. Thank you. Yes, I'm um, Stephanie Schlettenhofer. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah, looks great. Right, great. Okay, I'm going to show the advisor recommendation form that um, is used at Purdue University within Unitime. Um, there are a couple of ways users can access it. One is for this online student scheduling dashboard that um, Advisors often ask us data and about their users. They can access it there or from the recommendations, but I'll go into it from the student scheduling dashboard. Um, it brings up a form. It allows them to control whether or not the student can register. I'm going to put the student into course request enabled, which means they can go through the pre-registration process. Um, I've already entered some courses in here, but I can see that the student already has a um, couple of courses in their course requests and if i look farther into here it shows that they are in a learning community women in management and they're reserved into those courses you can also see that one of these has a pending override um, and i'm going to go and tell the student i'm advising them that based on their major they need to take math 160 10. i'm going to mark it critical because if they don't get it this term they wouldn't be able to make progress to their degree. So when they go through batch, it's going to give them priority over other students. I've already put in a COM and an SLA for communications courses. I'll add another to advise them because the communication courses are high demand and it may take a couple of courses before they find finds one that works for their schedule. Um, they advise them to take a social class to ensure they want to, they get a full schedule in case they don't um, get all the classes in the batch um, we're going to sign them up say that they could take as a substitute course for any of the courses above theater let's say while I'm talking to them they say they want to get started on their um, foreign language um, components so um, they're going to sign up for a Spanish course um, as advisor. I'd let them know that, you know, you're going to have to request it and override for this. So put that in. Um, so there are notes that can go with the virtual courses. They can put alternatives. They can mark things as critical. They can open up for the status for the student, share their pins. And it comes 
pre-populated with a set of standard notes that um, the advising committee agreed that would be good to show to all the students. If I don't feel like doing that, the other notes I put out, I can go, you know, just make sure you've cleared your registration holds. You don't have to have all those. And then I submit this and it looks through and it says, mentions everything that this student's gonna have trouble with. Um, oh, the theater, since we added that Spanish, if they get it and um, the second math class, it would put them over their max credit. So might wanna advise them to go ahead and request the override here as well. So let's submit it. Um, it's gonna go validate again. This time I'm gonna go ahead and accept. You get a nice PDF that the, the advisors can either print and have the student sign or download and up to load to other locations. Um, then we can also have this sent to them as this email. They can add a message. And if they wanted to, they could include the course request or if the student had a schedule, the schedule in the email as well. Hit send and that gets shipped off to the student. Once again, there's a, they can download the PDF. And this is sort of the end of what the advisor would do. Um, the student can then go into course requests. And since I was in here earlier, I'm already connected up to Imogene. Um, whenever Imogene comes in, she gets a notice, hey, your requests have been populated with your advisor recommendations, review them and hit submit, submit requests to finalize your registration. Um, the student can hit submit requests. They don't, didn't have to type a single thing. Um, everything came in. Um, we're just gonna say my advice, request overrides and submit. This will then go through the whole process of getting the override request in process for the students. And when it's done and they'll be ready to go for the batch. Um, or if they were using the scheduling assistant, it would just go ahead and build a schedule for them. Um, the student has can see a confirmation of what they've done and print it if they would like. And so this is a fairly streamlined, straightforward way for to go from advisors providing data to the students being able to access it. And that's my talk. Great, thank you so much, Stephanie. And that was Stephanie Schlottenhofer from Purdue. <laughs> and uh, next we have a video from Benito Gonzalez. And on deck we have Paul. So we'll just queue up that video now. And uh, this video, uh, is called Fixing Web Component Load Issues in UPortal. Hi, it's me, Benito from Unicon. I wanted to take this opportunity to share how you can address some web component issues by changing how we load them into the page. To bring everyone up to speed, let's touch on web components and what they do for UPortal. Web components are a combination of client code, like JavaScript, styling, and HTML that are packaged together and are isolated from the rest of the page. This isolation is especially appealing to uPortal implementations as we often have content from desperate sources. Web components live in the browser but can talk to backend APIs to deliver interesting content. uPortal has several APIs that cover user details, portlet definitions, and layout structure, among others. The uPortal community has developed flexible web components that are now found on many modern uPortal builds. Especially popular are the grid and carousel web components that can be driven by portlet and layout APIs. When we first started sharing web components, we wanted to make adoption as simple as possible. This led to the recommendation of creating a simple content portlet that imports the files for the web components along with Vue or other needed frameworks and define the web component parameters. It was all centralized in a single portlet definition. In a layout with the web component defined in a simple content portlet, the script tags for the JavaScript import would appear in that location of the document along with the web component tag. This approach leads to two issues. The first one becomes obvious when the page breaks. What causes the page to break? 
Well, the page does not break when you have different web components. It breaks when a layout has the same web component twice. Most of our web components are written with the assumption that it is only loaded once on the page. So when a second import of the web component file occurs, there is a conflict. This can be overcome in the code, but the second issue cannot. The second issue is when the browser loads the web component file. With the previous recommendation, the imports occur when the page is partially loaded as they are in the body. This can cause visual anomalies and page flashes. Our new recommendation is to have the files imported in the head tag. This cannot be done via our portlet definition as they can only add content to the body. Instead, we have to go to the skin files. One of the skin files, skin.xml, defines CSS and JavaScript files that should be imported into the page. Here we can add entries for frameworks such as view and web components. These will now be added to the head tag. We still use simple content portlets to add web component tags into the page, but we no longer import files in the portlet definitions. With this approach, the framework and web component files are loaded before the browser gets to the body tag and starts rendering the page. No more popping pages or breaking name conflicts in the middle of the page. If you would like to learn more about uPortal, please join our mailing list at uPortal-user at aperio.org or visit www.aperio.org slash projects slash uPortal. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Benito. Our next uh, presentation will be from Paul, and on deck will be David and Chris. So Paul Hibbets from uh, Simon Fraser University, he's going to be telling us about overcoming LMS content constraints with the magical documentation site generator, Boxify. So I'll turn it over to you, Paul. Thanks very much, Sean. It's my pleasure to join everyone today. I'm really excited to share with you uh, my most recent open source project, um, and it involves Doxify. So a little bit of backstory quickly. Uh, I'm a sessional instructor at SFU here in Vancouver, Canada, and I'm also a big proponent of open education and open resources and open source software. So I love connecting with all of you today. Um, in the past, I've done uh, one previous open source project with the Grav CMS. Grav CMS is a flat file based CMS that uses Markdown. And I find Markdown a great way to share open educational resources. But found a lot of people interested in using Grav and using Markdown kind of found the requirement of having a web server a non-starter. So I started looking around for other alternatives. And I came across this really interesting document generator called Doxify. Doxify is unique in the field because it does not require a build process. There is no requirement to execute a build process once you edit your markdown to regenerate the site that is available for people to see. That is super cool because it allows people with less technical knowledge to use markdown and launch sites that look like this. And as you can see, pre-traditional site content and three quarters of the screen left side nav bar. So it got me thinking, what could I do to help other educators use this in their own other courses? You could use a class site. You could publish OER resources using Markdown and Doxify. So this brings me to my, my more recent project, uh, open source project. It's called Doxify Open Course Starter Kit. I'm going to be really brave here. and I'm going to try to show you live how fast you can get this going. All you need to do is have a GitHub account. You do not need a web server, no PHP, anything like that. So we're going to just say, use this template. I'm going to type in my Doxify site. And I'm going to create and clone that repository on my own GitHub account. And once I do that, I'm going to use a feature in GitHub called GitHub Pages to generate my course site. So I'm going to go to Pages. I'm going to choose the folder that my content is in called docs. And then basically, that's it. So right now, and this may take a moment, by the way, GitHub is working for me. And it's generating the site automatically, as Doxify says, in the background. But let's just see. Maybe it's going to happen right away. Sometimes this can take up to a couple of minutes. So we'll see. We're going to go back to this and check that site out later. What about Sakai? How can you use Doxify Open Course Starter Kit with Sakai? Well, for example, 
Here's a standalone Doxify course starter kit with some sample course content. We've got a what's happening page. We've got a course welcome post. We've got week one with various items that the student would want to access. The unique thing about my approach is that I want people to reuse content inside or outside of their LMS. So going back here to our demo page, take a look at this Sakai site. So this is a Sakai site on uh, the Try Sakai. And as you notice, doesn't this content look familiar to you? So you can seamlessly embed content from any open course starter kit page without Global Nav, without the footer, and seamlessly integrate into Sakai. So here, for instance, is my week one page. It even will render a nice table of contents on the right side to help students find materials that they want. And for the student, it looks exactly pretty much like a Sakai page, but there's a little secret here, of course. If we went to resources and we scroll down, being on GitHub, it's collaborative. So you can go to the GitHub repository, you can edit your page on GitHub, you can even use a tool like GitHub Desktop and edit your course content on your desktop with one tap, push that up to GitHub pages, have it automatically rendered, and then have it appear in Sakai, or really any other LMS is fine. I also use Canvas LMS at SFU, and so I use that quite a bit there. Now, remember we left that site cooking on GitHub pages. Let's go back to that page. Let's see if we can refresh that page. Look at that. Oh my gosh, the demo people are so happy with me today. I can tap on that link, and here's our running Doxify site. As you can see, it took, what, three or four taps from GitHub pages, and now I'm running on my own GitHub account where I can edit my material. Um, the last thing I can also show you is thanks to Alan Reagan, by the way, of Aperio. Um, Alan put together so kindly this little uh, Google Docs guide uh, with an overview of the Docsify Open Course Starter Kit with a focus on Sakai and the ability to easily embed content using, I believe it's called the Web Control Tool, if my memory serves me correctly. Um, and so in just a moment, I will share that URL and some other URLs in the global chat. Uh, before we wrap up, because I think I'm just about out of time, I can also show you a Canvas installation so this is Canvas LMS, also using Doxify Open Course Starter Kit for all the, or the, all the LMS content. So again, it looks to the student like it's just a simple Canvas site. And again, of course, if we go to a, a site page like um, Topics, we can easily embed any content that we want. This is also a great way to go beyond any content constraints that might be in your LMS and to embed any kind of markdown-based content that you want. So I think that's about just a wrap for my talk. I will post a in the global chat. I'll just put all my contact info and as well the links to everything that you just saw in the past, what, four and a half minutes, um, including the project on GitHub. Of course, it's open source. And I'd love to hear after this session, feel free to contact me by email or on Twitter any comments or feedback that you have. Um, and that's a wrap. I think that's everything uh, that I want to cover today. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this lightning session. Great, thanks so much, Paul. We gave you an extra minute or two there, <laughs> just because you're on a roll. But there's a lot of excitement in the chat. I think a lot of people are really excited about the things that you're showing, show, sharing here today. So thank you so much for presenting. And thank I'm you. sure there'll be a lot of people contacting you about that too. So uh, next up, we have David and Chris. And on uh, the deck, we have another video from Benito that we'll get to in a moment. Uh, so our next presenters are David Schofer from Safe Classroom and Chris Alex Al Algazine, there we go, sorry, <laughs> Chris Algazine from Marist College. And together they are going to be presenting today how Marist College faculty improves accessibility and security with Safe Classroom. And with that, I will turn it over to the two of you guys. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, my name is David Schroper. I'm the CEO and founder of SAFE, and I'm here today with Chris Algazine of Marist College, and we're going to tell you a little bit about a project that we've been working on together. Uh, so, Chris, let me turn it over to you to uh, introduce yourself. Hi, thanks, David. And yes, everybody, I'm Chris Algazine. I'm a senior professional lecturer at Marist College, where I teach computer science courses. Excellent. Thank you, Chris. Um, 
so I'm going to start by talking, by showing you a video of what SAFE is and, and how it works. Uh, we can show you a demo of exactly what the, what the uh, bells and whistles are later, uh, but I'd be happy to show you just a general idea of, um, of what the product does um, with a quick video. So I'm going to just pull up a video right now. Bear with me one second. All right, you should all be able to hear this. It's just about two minutes. Welcome to Safe Classroom. This short video will show you what it is, how it works, and why it makes teaching easier in a post-COVID world. At one time, every student had to come into a classroom to learn, but the pandemic required a major shift to online web conferences, including Zoom. As students come back to the classroom, higher education has arrived at a moment when inclusivity, accessibility, and engagement can take a big leap forward. Using Zoom combined with in-person learning, students could have the ability to attend class simultaneously, whether they are sick, traveling, or even don't regularly come to campus. Working professionals can also take classes without the commute. Even bad weather does not need to cancel class anymore. But using both modalities at once can create challenges because faculty have to manage two separate classrooms at the same time, and everything is different in each. Invitations are different, taking attendance is different, even engaging with students is different. Introducing Safe Classroom. Developed in partnership with Marist College, Boston College, and the University of the Bahamas. In just a few clicks, faculty can now reach out to all students by sending a message directly to their mobile phones or email and let the student join the class, whether with Zoom or in person, all without entering a meeting ID or even a password. Safe Classroom allows faculty to see the attendance on the Safe Classroom dashboard by modality and name in real time. We even provide tools to see how many students have arrived and let you give the no-shows a nudge by sending another reminder on their mobile phones, email, or both. After your students have arrived, engage with them all equally, whether they are in person or on Zoom with our raise hand feature. That lets students reply yes, no, directly through their mobile phones and faculty can see all responses in real time. Faculty can use this data to automatically generate attendance reports and finally have data to support a student's participation grade, saving hours each semester. And the institution can even use the data as part of the accreditation audit. To learn more, go to the safe.io slash classroom. Okay, so again, um... There's a lot we can show you. We can give you a live demo. I'd love it if you could reach out to either Professor Algazine or myself uh, after this session. We can put our emails in the chat room and uh, we can show you a, a deeper dive on how the product works. But that's what it does. It's really making a difference in terms of how you manage, uh, especially a hybrid or high flex classroom where you can completely automate attendance and you can make a big difference in terms of uh, how you engage with all the students, whether they're on Zoom or in person or both at the same time. I also wanted to mention that we do have a $1,000 grant available that we're very excited about. We want as many colleges and universities and other types of institutions to try uh, this product. So here's a QR code for a quick application. Again, happy to tell you much more about this. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chris Algazin so he can tell you more about his experience actually using the product. Thanks, David. As David just pointed out, I'm actually using this in the classroom. And there's two things I'd like everybody to know about Safe Classroom. First, attendance taking is probably my biggest problem, which gets solved with David's platform. Large classes require as much as five minutes of class time when I should be teaching to take attendance. Students arriving late to class, and that happens regularly. I'm sure we all know this and experience it. It requires me to go back through the list, especially early in the semester when I haven't learned who the students are and I don't know everybody's names. I've tried manual sign-in sheets to try and offload that work and avoid it being something that takes up class time, but it's distracting and literally just means I have work to do outside of the classroom later to take those manual inputs and put them in our system. SAFE provides me a one button solution that takes attendance down to five seconds of my time. And it provides me with that lovely dashboard you saw in the video. I can view on my computer screen in the background or off to the side while I start teaching on time. This dashboard gives me a wealth of information. Who isn't going to attend today? Who needs to attend remotely if I'm providing that option in a hybrid setting? And who is arriving late? 
The second thing I want everybody to know about SAFE is it lets me securely start up my Zoom sessions for those async and hybrid classes. With the same push of the button, and since Marist already has it integrated with our LMS and with our Zoom accounts, I'm also immediately and securely inviting all of my students to attend the online class session. No more worrying about Zoom bombing incidences since there's no link and passcode in an email floating around out there. I push one button and push notifications are securely sent to my students and only my students in my class for that session. SAFE allows me to start class on time, every time. And for David to be offering institutions a $1,000 grant to help defray the cost of integrating his product into their LMS, pilot the solution and prove to you how great I already know it is. Well, that's a pretty amazing offer. Kind of hard to turn down, frankly. Uh, we took David's offer at Marist and we used that money to pay for a student worker in our digital education team to do the work. So it actually turned into a resume building experience for one of our students at the same time. So with that, I'll turn it back over to David now. 30 seconds. Okay, Professor Algazine, thanks very much for that insight. Um, I don't know if we have any time left, uh, but I'd love to open it for uh, to any questions that anybody may have. Can I use this with big, big blue button? Uh, not yet. We are we are have integrated with Zoom successfully. Big blue button is next. Uh, we're big supporters, uh, all of us here, of open uh, open source software. So big blue button is next. We can. Um, uh, we very much want to integrate. We just haven't done that yet. Thanks so much, guys. We have to cut you off there. Uh, it looks like there's some okay. other questions about whether it integrates with Sakai, but maybe you can answer that in the chat. I did. Perfect. Great. Very good. Thanks. Great. Uh, we're going to go to our last session today, which is from Benito uh, Gonzalez from Unicon again. Uh, this one called Incubation Overview, What's Growing? So we'll just queue up the next video here. Hi folks, it's me again, here to share some basic information around Aperio incubation. So why would you incubate your project? Incubation is a process by which an open source project meets certain criteria to be officially sponsored by Aperio. While the sponsorship is a significant indication of a healthy project, it's the process that confirms, if not steers your project towards characteristics of a healthy open source project. This is captured best in our exit criteria. One, all source code and materials should be properly licensed with an approved outbound license. While incubating, we go over where and how licensing should be presented. Contributor agreements are addressed to confirm we have no contributions that can lead to ownership disputes. Trademarks are also reviewed. Demonstrate an active and diverse development or participation community is another criteria. Um, things like, is there more than one contributor? Are there more than a few adopters? And are there activities and or events to foster participation? A fifth criteria is what governance structure is in place to oversee the project. Incubation mentors often provide assistance in making sure the structure matches the project. Six, synergy with other Aperio software and or communities is considered, but not a hard requirement. The seventh criteria is projects should also have infrastructure in place to support the source code and communities. This was a bigger deal a decade ago, but now with GitHub, Bitbucket, and GitLab, this is now an easy criteria to meet. There are others, but these are the ones that I often focus on when mentoring an incubating project. Besides a healthy project, there are more benefits to becoming an Aperio sponsored project. For instance, some institutions restrict their adoption of open source projects to those with a sponsoring foundation or company. Yet another advantage of being an Aperio sponsored project is that you have a group of other projects to engage and learn from that have a rich history of multiple decades. Aperio also provides a framework of services and processes for Aperio software communities. Let's go over the incubation process at a high level. First, there is a proposal submission. A community member or members may submit an incubation proposal to the incubation working group. 
Next, the proposal will be reviewed by both the Imperial Board and the IWG for recommendation. Once approved, the IWG will first assign a, at least one mentor, but likely two, and second, establish a timeline for incubation with the project. This is simply a guide for planning. There are no hard commitments. On a regular basis, usually quarterly, mentors will check in with the project to report progress against the exit criteria to the IWG. Mentors may and often do interact more often to help guide the project. Mentors provide a great deal of knowledge and experience garnered from other projects. They may not know all the answers, but have a network of contacts and the IWG itself that is invaluable. Eventually, an incubation project meets the exit criteria and is recommended for promotion to sponsored projects, or the incubation is incomplete and the project may become an unsponsored contribution. Endorsement of a project requires a positive vote from the Aperio Board. What if you have an interest in the incubation process but don't have a project or community that would be suitable? Well, you're in luck. We're looking for a few volunteers that are willing to become incubation mentors. You will have the opportunity to shadow another mentor as they guide a project through the process. As you gain confidence and experience, you'll be able to guide other projects through the process as well. So now that you're all excited about incubation, you're probably wondering, how do you get involved? Well, let's make that easy. Visit www.aperio.org slash incubation to get a more detailed overview of incubation. Then send a message to incubation at aperio.org. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Benito. Um, we saw a lot of great topics today um, all across all of the different projects at Sakai here. And uh, so if you're thinking about uh, creating a new project or you have one that's getting started up, you might want to check out that incubation uh, uh, page to learn more about the process. And, and maybe you could be the next Imperial project. And maybe next year at Open Imperial Lightning Talks, you'll be presenting to us about your uh, up and coming new project. So. Uh, we've made it through all the presentations. I know it was really quick and the hour flew by, but uh, that's kind of the point. <laughs> Hope everybody got a taste of all these uh, different topics and uh, projects that are going on. I want to thank all the presenters uh, for speaking with us today. Inga, Andy, Stephanie, Nito, Paul, David, and Chris. Thank you so much for speaking. Um, and thank everyone. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending as well um, for both your questions in the chat and the enthusiastic support in the chat. So thank you all for, for attending. This time, I'm going to turn it over to Patrick for some closing remarks. Hello. Can everyone hear me OK? Yes, we can. Yep. Uh, thanks, Sean. Uh, that was excellent. And to, I guess you'll end up as my defensive partner here uh, on the uh, ice uh, when we ever get out on the hockey rink. <laughs> um, uh, I wanted to, first of all, uh, uh, thank everyone for participating today. Um, it's not over the, yet, uh, Open Aperio, uh, either today and tomorrow. Um, we have our upcoming sponsor sessions, um, but uh, please do not think of those as sales pitches. Those are great opportunities to um, work with folks that are deeply engaged with the Aperio community and all sorts and uh, all sorts of uh, projects and communities. Um, so it's an opportunity to, to work with folks that are actively involved in developing the tools that we all rely on and that we're all working with. So please take time to uh, join uh, those sessions right after this. Uh, tomorrow, as Sean just said, um, there are this was a lot this highlights a lot of the great projects happening in Aperio. Um, tomorrow is the Stack Hack, and the goal with the Stack Hack is to uh, create a single reference implementation, if you will, um, integrating all or as many, uh, not only Aperio tools, but other open source tools, providing for interoperability and, and uh, creating a single platform to showcase the tools um, and the opportunities that are available through Aperio and the Aperio community. Um, so that whole day is really going to be uh, driven by the participants. Um, what do we need to do to create that stack hat or create that stack? Um, uh, that's not just a technology uh, perspective either. It's it's you know what are the issues around uh, creating 
uh, shared learning environments in terms of content and learning objectives and and courses and course design and pedagogy and other things. So we want to get as many people in there as possible to help create that reference model that we can showcase the Aperio tools and communities to the rest of the world, having a single place to demonstrate all the features and functionality available through the great tools that everyone here has been working on. Um, so join us tomorrow for the Stack Hack. Um, again, I'd like to congratulate Alan, Carlos, Christopher, Julianne, Tobias, and Jim on their Dolphin Awards. Um, thank you again for all the work you've done uh, for Aperio, and uh, um, congratulations. Uh, also, thank you to the planning committee. Um, the sessions were fantastic. I was trying to listen to two at a three at a time. Um, excellent work by the planning committee. Uh, if I if we were in person, I'd ask everyone to stand and applaud, uh, offer some applause for, for Kathy and Jen for all the work they've done. Uh, the sessions went smoothly. Um, the platforms were all set up. It's a lot of work behind the scenes. Thank you for doing that. Um, I'd also like to, of course, thank Blindside Networks uh, for Big Blue hosting our Big Blue Button environment, EDF, Longside, and Unicon for uh, sponsoring the sessions or the entire um, conference. Um, and again, last, I'll end on thanking you, the Aperio community, uh, for all your continued collaboration and co-creation around these uh, important educational tools. So I'll see you uh, with the sponsored sessions coming up, and then I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>